Welcome to the Dev Ready Podcast. On today's episode of the Dev Ready Podcast, I have Alex Sampson with me. Thanks, Alex. Hi, Anthony. Me. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself so I don't make any mistakes and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, uh, uh, the pleasure. So I'm Alex Sampson. I'm a tech entrepreneur doing this stuff uh, for 24 years, starting from the school. I made three exits uh, and uh, running the uh, software uh, business uh, for 14 years. And after the recent exit, I decided to jump on the sea side. So um, here I am already one year in this journey and I would like to share my finding experience, uh, wins and losses as well. Oh, it's exciting. To, you don't hear about many, oh, I haven't heard of many that make that transition. It's sales are hard to get by. And then yeah, to actually go into that space, a lot of them jump into the next startup rather than make the transition to VC. But I guess that may be depending on the size of the exit you have. <laughs> It's kind of a dream was uh, uh, always uh, like I'm uh, I made a great exit, uh, say at least $10 million. So I have capital and I'm launching this firm. But the reality that uh, if you are a VC manager, you don't need a uh, 10 million capital. You just need to commit 1% of your capital and you need to acquire capital. So you also need to do fundraising from uh, different kind of investors yeah. uh, to pull the capital and then invest and deploy them into the startups. So that's the idea. Uh, um, yep. But the tricky thing uh, that when you are uh, fundraising for a startup, you covering all costs, operations, all the stuff, and uh, when you are fundraising uh, to the fund, uh, mostly you need to have a, a own capital to cover uh, initial years of the starting of launching the VC firm because. Uh, your operation is covering by 2% management fee and uh, it's not enough if you have a capital like five or $10 million. Uh, I, uh, I initially I started from uh, calculating uh, the numbers and uh, I can say the minimum sustainable uh, fund size is $30 million, but it's quite impossible to raise 30 million if you never, uh, never tried it before and uh, you just uh, new in the game. Yeah, starting a fund is quite different than being a VC. Yeah. You need to have that, you know, like you said, that ability to raise funds from other VCs, build up yours. It's not all yeah. your capital, but you have yeah, to have the runs on the board and the track record as well. Yeah, you need to track record and track record in investing uh, because a track record as an entrepreneur is, uh, is great. It's very valuable. It's uh, very interesting because if you uh, take a look on... Uh, uh, team composition of different VC firms. You can see guys from financial world, uh, some ex-entrepreneurs, uh, corporates, uh, very, very different uh, uh, backgrounds and cultures and all these backgrounds make sense. So with any backgrounds, you can uh, come to the game, but also you need uh, some investing experience. And uh, usually I can say that there are only two ways uh, to uh, have distraction is to go to uh, work in uh, some VC firm as employee for at least, I don't know, five years, three, five, ten years, uh, or uh, have uh, mm -hmm. some capital to start investing as an angel or being a like angel syndicate, okay. angel group uh, like this. And that's probably where you see a lot of the other startups that have had sales and exits before. If they move into the space, if they get a decent enough exit, they may move into that angel investing or seed so then they can just invest into other startups. But yeah, pivoting to a fund is very different. The traction as angel investment is makes sense. Uh, but fund operations, is a, a, it's, I can say it's next, next uh, level of complexity because when you're angel, uh, you uh, manage your own capital, then you are fund, you need to fundraise yep. and fundraise is very difficult because you need mm -hmm. to fundraise uh, big checks, uh, working with uh, family offices, high net uh, worth individuals and uh, some institutions uh, later yep. stages. Then you are fundraising for, for the fund, you are selling some strategy, some idea, your background. And uh, for me, uh, the hardest thing at the moment is to define the strategy uh, because when I uh, finding something interesting, I, um, I see complexity again. For example, I'm um, living life like a digital nomad. So uh, working uh, internationally and globally for 10 years and uh, uh, 
uh, I'm in a position that I can choose uh, mm -hmm. the location, the geography of investing and uh, all this. Uh, it's great if you have a geography focus. So being global, it's uh, uh, it's quite hard to be global, even in uh, early stages. But if you're choosing a location, uh, should invest in uh, ecosystems of uh, scientific uh, tech backgrounds with tech, good tech universities, uh, like it can be in uh, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, if you're speaking about uh, other big region, uh, or should I invest in, uh, for example, in Indonesia, because Indonesia has a, a great market, it's growing super fast, uh, but it's a different type of investing. And first, uh, you need to invest in technology, you need to invest in, uh, invest in um, uh, like pretty tech savvy guys. And in a case with a big market, you need to invest in uh, those who can sell, who can uh, do marketing well, who can uh, uh, execute a go-to-market strategy in the, the home country, uh, big country. And uh, okay, so this is the first thing uh, you need to choose. And uh, the next thing is the industry. And like AI is hyping uh, recent years. Uh, so this already, you, you can't uh, declare that I'm investing in AI. It's uh, the same like I'm investing in internet or I'm investing in computer science. So, so it's very, very, very broad. Uh, so if you're investing in AI, you need to uh, define what kind of AI. Is it uh, AI for uh, industry 4.0 or, or is it uh, B2C AI, consumer apps, uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, I can say that mostly, mo most of startups, uh, they by default uh, have some AI. AI can be the the and the engine, the core of the the startup, or it can be uh, like assistant, uh, supplementally uh, uh, supplementally uh, to the startup. But yeah, every mm -hmm. everyone already have AI in uh, under the hood. Yeah, it's a there's a lot of chatbots that don't need to be yeah. there. <laughs> Yeah, everyone gets on that bandwagon. So it, it is important, like I think we mentioned that having that strategy and that approach. So if, as a VC fund, you, you then have to have a strategy that's going to attract the right investors that go along with yours. And how are you different from another VC fund? And then how's your strategy going to give me more return? Which is probably an analog to a startup trying to find product market fit for their product. It's what's the right messaging? What's the right approach? How am I going to get my customers effectively using what I'm providing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, How have you found that the learnings that you had over those 14 years with the, the engineering firm and the consultancy, and then helping you inform your decision or your strategy as moving to the VC fund world? I coming to this uh, industry uh, uh, with entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and um, uh, for example, I started looking at the VC firm as a, a product with unit economy. So I need uh, to understand the cost of uh, investor acquisition, the cost of uh, building a deal flow of startups, uh, and uh, what team I need, uh, what team capacity do I need to uh, handle all this stuff, how to make due diligence. And uh, by the end, I need to understand the, the economy per action, per investment action. And this is uh, the thing I'm still working on. As I, as I said that I found that the capital should be around 30 millions. So it can, it's, it's great if we, you're able to raise the fund one. Uh, I found uh, there are some examples in, in the world, mostly in the United States, uh, the fund one with uh, 30 or bigger capital. Uh, but most of the world uh, raising mm -hmm. the first capital, uh, the first fund is like a proof of concept. Uh, it can be three million, five million dollars. So you need to just play in, uh, in sandbox, uh, trying everything, uh, get the skin in game, and uh, then you can raise the second fund, which can be relatively bigger. Um, so yeah, it's proof of concept, then MVP, and then you are going to the uh, free free fly. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's the th the, the yeah. first thing and. Uh, you're absolutely right about uh, the product market fit uh, term. I also uh, found uh, the term is um, 
then you're deciding about your strategy is also called uh, the thesis investment thesis um the combination of industry and uh, the geography uh can lead you to the empty market for example uh the dna sequestering uh costs drop significantly uh from one million dollar to one thousand dollar and maybe in the next five years uh the dna genome of the human will cost just one hundred dollar so it uh this cost open uh mm-hmm. the opportunity for entrepreneurs for engineers uh, moving this uh, from scientific world to the real application world and uh, um, i see that uh, it can uh push the software startups in a biotech industry. So I'm start looking biotech in a, based in a, around me. Uh, so it's, it was Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, mm-hmm. uh, Korea, and biotech, I say uh, data, uh, data startups about uh, for biotech or a, any software around the biotech and nothing nothing here just a few in the silicon valley so uh the idea is uh is fresh okay. but it's too fresh to start so uh i need to check it again uh, a year ago uh a year after so it's the the emerging markets are probably different than the mid markets and then where the leaders are especially on those ideas if it's very new or if there's it probably depends on the culture of the market more than anything uh yeah uh so if it's uh the big existing market so there's already many many vcs many many capital usually the capital much more than uh, good startups to invest in and uh, the competition between investors is too high so uh, being an emerging uh, investor you need uh, to find something specific uh but not empty and uh, it's also the the yeah. challenges uh of defining your investment strategy how, how have you found that journey of trying to define that strategy? Because as a VC fund, you have to have some rate of returns that you're bringing on to investors and investing in startups in the entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial space is not a, a quick game. Yeah, this is uh, another challenging in the VC world, uh, mostly in the last few years uh, when we see a decline in many VC metrics. So I start um, I start uh, speaking with different, uh, more experienced VC about the fundraising and uh, the insights can be like let's let, let's take uh, Indonesia or Malaysia. Uh, there are many wealthy individuals or conglomerates, corporates which uh, have capital to invest in, but uh, the maturity of uh, technology culture is uh, still developing. So for them uh, the most easy and uh, mm, most, most easy to uh, access opportunity to invest in retail estate, for example, uh, to build a mall or something uh, more like private equity. Then, then you have a cash flow and you can uh, assess uh, the businesses uh, in a traditional way. Uh, but when we look uh, in a Singapore or Australia investors, they are more uh, willing to um, make risk investments like just have a small small part of their portfolio they can invest in vc firms and vc firms there's a uh, established vc firms so the uh, people from again from uh, dubai or asia they are more willing to uh, invest in uh, top tier vc firms but top tier research firms can give you the mm-hmm. high uh, returns and uh, this is well known uh, that uh, emerging VC uh, pushing more hard because they uh, are they in a living or um, the partners uh, more involved in um, groundwork. So by the end, it can give you uh, more returns. But what about the traction? What about yeah. uh, how uh, how many years I'm going to be in this game? Uh, because uh, Average uh, average time to exit is uh, from five to ten years, and uh, okay, some startups, some portfolio yeah. companies can exit in five years, but some of them you need to take care about uh, for ten years. And uh, are you those person that 
can be in this mm -hmm. game uh, for the next 10, 15 years. It's also the question. Yeah, and that's 10 years if you're only investing in things in year one. If you keep investing in startups every year, then that just keeps pushing out as well. And you'll have all those different opportunities. It, I can imagine it's a very difficult thing to try and maintain as a VC fund. It's You're not doing a yearly return. You have to try and convince them that at some point, every couple of years, there'll be a big exit that at least gets some return that makes up for that loss of yearly returns that they will get with a traditional investment. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Uh, another thing interesting uh, that uh, my experience uh, from mostly from the zero to one uh, for early stage, idea stage startups, uh, definitely only on early stage startups like pre seed, seed, series A, maybe series B. Uh, and um, at some point I ask, my, uh, I ask a question, uh, what about the secondary market? Like, I, um, I'm a pre-seed investor, so I give small checks to many, many startups. Uh, so I have super high risks. The most risk uh, mm -hmm. can be in a VC world. And uh, after some product market fit validation, idea validation, uh, team composition validation, and any, many, many validations of uh, this uh, team idea, the market, some of them uh, become good, uh, good asset. And um, what's the reason for me to uh, sit in, in the stake until the exit after the 10 years? Because I can't contribute any experience uh, for late stage companies. It's a real different world for me. So uh, I see logically that uh, yeah. I can uh, make an exit as a VC on the secondary market, say after the series A or on the series A, and then redeploy this capital again to the pre seed. So, uh, some professionals, some investors will work in yep. just in the uh, early stages. Others will be working in late stages, and uh, yeah, and uh, so some of uh, will be after like yeah. uh, an IPO level. I guess that depends on sort of your ri <laughs> yeah your risk appetite, and then the type of return you expect. Because if you're in the seed stage, you're going to get a, a decent return if they get to a Series A from that very early stage investment, and you'll have a larger share when you get to that IPO, it's gonna be very small. If it's series B or C again, it's gonna be a smaller stake, but it's larger numbers. And those ones are probably a lot quicker to cash out. So investment will go in and it won't take as, it won't take five, 10 years to get the next, the cash out on the next step. Yeah, but, uh, but, but the fact, uh, there's um, no culture for the second market. I haven't found it. Uh, it's uh, okay. mostly because uh, the crisis in the industry so many VCs start uh, selling uh, the assets, uh, the stakes uh, to have some liquidity. Uh, so it's great opportunity to buy uh, mm -hmm. on the second market. Uh, but I would like to see uh, the the clear picture, the clear culture of uh, one working in the early stages, others in a... So one will work uh, on the early stages and uh, others working on the late stages. And uh, you, you said, um, you said right about uh, the stepping from the round from the stage to the stage. Uh, and if people start speaking about the valuation, yeah, so the main business is to buy the stake for the small price and sell the stake to, for the higher price. So it's all about the valuation for VC. And uh, yep. I start looking for business metrics the startups had an exit. So for example, uh, the, the mm -hmm. most simplest example is uh, um, revenue. And for example, uh, the correlation between revenue and exit valuation could be like three times, five times, sometimes 10 times. It's very depends, but it's not uh, mm -hmm. not a different. So uh, for example, we can take three or five times. And uh, uh, for example, uh, we as a VC, uh, we have a, a financial model of other operations that we need to uh, make exit on 10x. So if we are making an investment in startup with valuation, say uh, $50 million in the Series A, uh, so the exit valuation should be uh, half a billion. So it's very clear math. Uh, so the question is, uh, what the revenue the startup uh, has at the moment and how fast uh, it should grow to reach uh, 100 million revenue to 
be mm -hmm. estimated, uh, evaluated uh, as a half a billion startup. And doing this math from the end, from the mm -hmm. exit valuation, you can uh, uh, like reverse engineer this to the pre seed or seed uh, checks and their correlation with uh, uh, the revenue. And um, the problem of uh, the startup market that you need not just have a uh, good revenue, but you need to uh, grow very fast, uh, really super fast. You need to grow uh, faster yeah. than the market. But sometimes you, the startup is going to the market which not growing, like uh, old big market, uh, say agriculture, for example. Uh, and in this case, you need to uh, penetrate the market uh, to change the, uh, the composition of competitors, of technologies there. And there's also the question how fast you can do it. Those traditional markets become difficult then because they, they've got an ingrained way of doing things. Maybe they're very slow for technology adoption. So then that's not, that could be very enticing in the long term if the sales there, but the growth rate may take longer than you probably expect. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, for VC, it can be, um, means uh, the zombie uh, company, which can be self-sustainable, uh, profitable, but they grow too slow mm -hmm. uh, to... Uh, have these uh, 10x yeah so how do you manage that as a vc then where you've got that formula that you're working on but not every investment is going to give you a return so how it, it's how, how do you manage that <laughs> there's a there's a, some statistics uh, like uh, 70 90 percent will fail uh, again it's the question what to yep. call fail in the first case it's uh, bankruptcy but if it's a zombie startup which have profit but not can grow it so also also fail for vc so usually it's we're talking about uh, the three percent of the portfolio which can benefit and uh, i also made a map um, mm -hmm. to calculate how many startup you need to assess you need to have an deal flow to uh, have the probability to find the unicorn and the numbers uh, in, in the thousands. And it was, was also the question like, okay, if I no. need to uh, process thousands of startups during the year to make one unicorn uh, uh, investments, uh, what team mm -hmm. do I need? So it's again, the play, uh, the question about, uh, okay, I need a team, team need a cost, uh, cost need a management fee. So I need a bigger capital or I need to invest yep. in operations for the first years. Uh, but um, yep. an another side of the question, uh, you need to give a traction, um, how to find uh, the startup which can, uh, can benefit and uh, for me is a uh, uh, emerging VC uh, it's uh, very important uh, to build attraction uh, like uh, a five star a class uh, attraction uh, to attract uh, LPs then I will ready to launch yep. the fund um, so I'm mm -hmm. I'm trying to do uh, for roughly um, you do the uh, market due diligence mostly it's market due diligence it's an interesting position you're mm -hmm. in yeah, you're a you're a a startup VC fund. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're doing the same things, but at a VC level. Yeah, it's it's hard to switch off my startup uh, mindset, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm using these techniques. Um, so regarding the due diligence, um, and also I'm a mentoring. Uh, I'm mentoring in a few accelerators and also in private mentoring. And uh, the key things in my mentor, my own mentor program is uh, the market research and unit economy. And for unit economy, you need uh, data from the market research. Uh, so it, it can be uh, different. And at this point, you can project uh, the numbers, uh, which you don't have at the moment, but it's your idea. It's you, you need to build a model uh, of your business, uh, having the customer acquisition cost, which is super high. Uh, in any industry and many founders don't realize uh, the the real how to hard to acquire users and have a good retention rate building this model uh, and then like show me how it will generate one million dollar revenue for example so how many uh, customer care you, you need to have uh, how you're going to onboard users uh, um, 
like engineers is uh, engineering R and D is uh, could be like thirty percent of the expenses and uh, operations, uh, operations, marketing, sales. This is uh, the most hard part, mostly for founders who came to the game with tech background. And uh, I also have seen uh, in my experience uh, with my previous clients, the usual use case, like the the market was validated by the decision of the stakeholder, the main stakeholder, because he's a investor. He has experience in a uh, mm-hmm. traditional business and feeling he understand everything. And uh, okay, let's start building and uh, move forward. And after... Uh, my team and I uh, spent a few years uh, in uh, such startups. Uh, uh, it uh, it takes your motivation to start new things, uh, even if it's not your things, but you are also have some expectations, some dreams, and uh, you would like to be in a part of something uh, mm-hmm. successful and big. Uh, we are also starting uh, some project validation about uh, will this team able to launch this uh, this business this startup and uh, if we are responsible for technical side uh, how they can be responsible for the the business side again mostly for the sales which in a b2b yep. um, b2b sometimes at biz dev so you need to uh, have a uh, the team of uh, strong uh, Salespersons uh, who are going to conferences uh, like grow hacking, like this, uh, and others is uh, about online marketing, which is, which is very complicated at this moment. Yes, yeah, so there's a lot there to consider, especially if you're a technical founder. Then you don't necessarily have those skills. You're more of engineer product side. So then you have the non-technical founders who may know how to do the sales or the biz dev, but don't have any of the technical expertise. So they need their tech partner to help them get started. Exactly, exactly. But if you are engineer, you can switch your engineering mindset to engineer the business, not the technology. And uh, yep. if, if it's, it, you can create another algorithm step by step, it's you can break things down. Yeah, definitely. And uh, this is a great, uh, great case then engineering uh, minds start uh, solve uh, business problems. Yep. They just need the the right people skills as well. Yeah, <laughs> some some of them aren't the most social people. <laughs> so, what are some sort of key takeaways that if there's anyone out there looking to raise at the moment or in the current market, what are some things that they should consider? Advices for startups: uh, the market is tough at the moment uh, uh, in terms of fundraising. So the problem is coming from the capital holders which don't invest too much in VC. So we, uh, VC funds uh, have uh, less capital to deploy than uh, two or three years before. Uh, so that's why uh, the, uh, yep. the assessment, the making decision is uh, uh, they made very carefully. But it's still possible to raise. Well, I can say uh, if we can, if you just look on the YouTube, there's a many, many bloggers and uh, some of the bloggers uh, looks very strange, but they still have an uh, audience. And I can say this uh, as an example that uh, any startup, any founder can find their uh, own investor. Um, so it's not advice for everyone, but from my perspective, uh, as I said, the most uh, important thing is a... Uh, um, is financial model, its business model, if it's sustainable on a big numbers, how you validate it. Mm-hmm. So it, in case if you're pre-revenue startup, if you're pre-revenue startup, there's many things how to validate idea. For example, try to reach out to your uh, prospective clients and sell them idea that you are building. If they are ready to spend uh, one hour of the call of interview, so they already invest uh, the commit commit that the probability of the buy your product or your service will be higher. If they will be engaged in uh, some, even your yeah. feedback uh, on the prototypes or something, it's, uh, it's great commitment. Or you can just place a wish list form or try to launch uh, on the product hunt and uh, get the uh, product hunt of the day or the week or something like that. So mm-hmm. the 
there's a many ways how to yep. confirm your idea on the wild market because any friends any partners who can say that's a great idea i will going to buy it uh it means nothing because cold market uh, is uh, very wild and uh, uh yeah. yeah and um always think about the competition that you compete not only with direct competitors but also with the behavior of the users to uh, solve their problems or their needs the same way they uh, they are uh, using uh, before you came to the market and uh it's a uh, it's a question about how to uh, overcome the innovation resilience and first you need to identify how how mm -hmm. how your users is solving the problem and then you need to give them uh, something more significant it just not to, uh, to be uh, just more useful or like just increasing usability uh, usually not uh, the real driver for the market the best momentum is uh, the crisis in the market because uh it's make changes in uh, beneficiaries of this market. For example, the old industry have uh, key players and, the, and these players trying to control the market and keep the status quo. And then uh, the crisis in the market, uh, there can be some changes and the businesses and uh, young users are more ready uh, for trying something uh, to uh, bring them back to the stable. But then they are in a stable state uh, you bring some innovations. Innovations means changes, and changes means uh, the losing of the stable uh, position, which is uh, quite hard. So uh, this also that the think uh, then you are launching the startup. Think from this perspective: if there is a crisis, or how you're going to overcome the innovation resilience. And in this case, it's great if you have uh, direct competitors because altogether you are uh, educate the market. You are trying to make some shift there. Yep. So, some really important takeaway key points there for someone who's going through the journey to pick that up. Um, so, if anyone wants to find out more or reach out um, to you, Alex, how can they do that and see if they can get it in involved in what you're doing or pitch to you? Uh, the best uh, the best way is uh, find me on LinkedIn. I'm uh, trying to be very active there. And also I have a website, um, swales.com. Uh, so you can find some contacts there and uh, some of my recent articles and uh, information about there. I'm mentoring in accelerators. Yep. Oh, perfect. And we'll add those notes into the show notes and put them on socials as well. Um, once again, thanks for joining me today. It's been a pleasure chatting to you and understanding the journey that you're going through as a a startup VC, I'll call it, which is something that I haven't heard too much before. Yeah, the, thanks for great questions. And uh, honestly, it's my first podcast interview and uh, I believe it's a great start. Thanks for this opportunity. Ah, it's been a good chat and you've, you, you, I'm sure you'll do plenty more. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.